Tonight, I want to speak about zombie startups. Zombie startups, just I'm going to be using the term a lot. I'm going to define it right away. Um, if you have questions, interrupt me if I'm not very clear. So what do I call a zombie startup? I call a zombie startup a company that is sort of leeching off subprime resources. These subprime resources can be corporate venture funds. It can be bad business angels who are only giving you money because of tax incentives. It can be weird corporate deals where you think you're building a company, but you're actually doing contracting work. And these zombie startups can survive for a long, long time, right? It's very easy in this current environment where there's a lot, a lot of money going into startups um, to raise, you know, little checks after a lot of time. And the funny thing with zombie startups is that you actually hear about them a lot. So not in the sense that people talk about zombie startups, in the sense that when you open TechCrunch or you open any sort of little news um, paper focused on tech, you'll hear a lot about companies that are fundraising. Um, and so you feel like a lot of these companies are doing very well because they're getting press coverage, but actually, actually that's usually not the case. And it's also very hard um, as a founder to know if you're building a zombie startup because, um, well, it also looks a lot like building a normal and successful company, right? Um, you're talking to investors like good founders are. You have some form of clients like good founders do. And um, you're hiring a team, right? So there are people who you're selling your dream to and you don't feel like you're completely crazy because other people are leaving their jobs to join yours. And a lot of the time when you, know, you realize you have this realization, you decide that you shut down. So there's several reasons that people don't talk about the fact that they want to shut down. And when they do, they just give you sort of generic reasons why, you know, it's like post-mortem articles. You see them all a lot, like lessons learned from building X. And like they always try to turn it as an example of their wisdom rather than an example of their stupidity, their incompetence, their lack of luck, or the fact that they were plain wrong about their, their assumptions, right? And for very good reason. It sucks to admit that you're wrong, that you're stupid, that you're incompetent, or that you were just unlucky. And a lot of the time, people hand, you know, double down on the fact that they were unlucky uh, because that's the sort of most palatable excuse. Um, but that tends to be a wrong one, right? And the problem is that this is sort of what the difference between linear growth and exponential growth is, right? So when you're building your company initially, it feels as though every incremental um, unit of effort, so you can think of the x-axis as effort and the y-axis as output or time, whatever. Initially, you're sort of putting the same amount of effort, and then the marginal amount of effort is bringing the same marginal amount of output. And whether you're going on the path of linear growth or exponential growth, it actually looks a lot alike, right? And so there's this big temptation when you're building a zombie company to think that the flat curve is just flat because you're at the beginning of this exponential. And so the question is, well, you don't want to be giving up when you're here, right? That's a horrible experience because you've been doing all this hard work and slowly every incremental amount of effort is bringing out more and more output. And so you're giving up on that huge opportunity, right? But a lot of the time what's actually happening is that you're on this bit. Right? You're starting and you're doing the same thing and you're only bringing in a tiny bit more. And even though you can build a great company like that, that's not the sort of company that you're, you were initially setting out to build. And once you realize that that's what's happening, um, usually there's sort of two reactions. Either you go through the path, the easiest path, which is just continuing, because that means that you save face with regards to your investors or at least you think so. You save face with regards to the people that you told, you know, I'm quitting my job because I had this great idea. And you save face with regards to the employees that you sold this big dream to. And there's, so it's essentially, you save face to the people that you don't want to let down. And there's a couple of people that, you know, you think that you're gonna be letting down when you do this, but that you're actually not letting down because they knew the risk from day one. So the first of these people is investors. Um, founders, systematically, when they're building a company, um, don't want to let their investors down. That's an issue that we had at Teach. So I'm gonna give you a bit of context before I move forward. So the company I built was a tutoring company. Um, we were essentially offering tuition services to high school and middle school students. And the people providing those tuition services were university students. And everything happened within a mobile app. So you took a picture of your math problem and then somebody would call you back within the app. And then, you know, it sounds like a great um, sort of good school bull idea. A lot of people have tried doing it. Not that many people have tried succeeded in building a good company out of it um, yet. I'm seeing some stuff that seems to be working, even though I'm pretty sure that if I'm reading about it, it's probably that there are soon to be discovered zombie. Um, and we raised money from angel investors and we were very wary of disappointing those angel investors, right? But the one thing that we were struggling to understand was that we were just one of the bets that these angel investors had made. 
And even though you know, we were reporting to them on a sort of, I think it was quarterly basis, and we were giving the updates on everything that was going on, and sometimes we were asking them for their help. Um, and so they knew when things were going well, they knew things, when things were going less well. So it's not like we came back to them one day saying, actually, you know what, we're shutting down the company because we're losing too much money. But still, we refused to make that, you know, to, make, to draw that lesson early enough. Um, and that meant that we spent a lot more of their money than we should have. And that's a frustrating experience for them, right? Because it means that I was using up more of their time than I needed to use, and I ended up wasting or spending more of their money than I needed to. Whereas if I'd admitted earlier on to myself and to them that some of the assumptions that I'd made were wrong, they would have been a lot happier. And fortunately, we were transparent enough that they weren't too mad. And we still sometimes do deals together on the companies that we advise now at the family. Um, but I'm sure that our relationship would have been even better if I'd say, you know, save them a couple more hundred thousand pounds. The other people that you founders don't want to disappoint are users. So a lot of the time, founders are so engrossed in their missions that they think that the day that their product goes down, their user's life is like going to be horrible for years and years, right? But like users were doing fine before you arrived. And unless you're doing something that's literally life-saving, and in that case, it's quite surprising that your company is doing so average, um, users will survive. And actually what happens quite often is that when companies are growing very moderately, the quality of the product goes down. And so users get a more shitty and more shitty experience. And so they end up growing frustrated. So it's usually, with regards to your users, a much better strategy to just, when you realize that you're not doing as well as you are, or as you were wishing to, uh, to do, to just shut down you know, at your peak. It's much nicer to leave at your prime. Just admit that the business model doesn't work and move on to the next thing. And this is huge, right? Because right now I'm going to talk about it as, from the perspective of a founder, and then I'll speak about it as well from the perspective of somebody who wants to join a startup. So just to get an idea, who here is, is a founder? Okay, mostly, or was a founder. Uh, and who here is looking to work for a startup or you know, has worked in a startup and is thinking about doing it again? Okay, less people. Cool, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll speak about that as well so everyone, uh, everyone gets something out of it, hopefully. Um, so regardless of what you're doing, you know, um, it's very important to think of whether you're a founder or an employee, to think of yourself not as... So the founders make the classical mistake of thinking that they're the first employee of the startup, right? But when you're building a company, you should think of yourself as the first shareholder of the startup. And that changes everything just in the way that you behave. Instead of you know, optimizing for your own survival, you should be optimizing for the equity worth of the company. And that's the only way that you're going to be building something hugely successful. And that comes to the last thing, which is employees. So people, obviously, the people that you impact the most when you're building a company is your employees. They had jobs before. You ask them to take on a big risk by leaving their jobs. Often they take a pay cut, not always, but sometimes they take a pay cut, pay cut essentially, uh, especially the, the first employees. And you know, the reason that they did that was in part because you were selling them a, bigger, a big dream uh, and a hope of doing very well. And so if one day you turn up to them and all of a sudden you announce, well, you have no job, all the money and the equity that, you know, or in the worth, valuable equity that you thought you had is actually worth zero. Um, and this is the big news. I've actually known that things weren't going that well for a very long time. Then they're going to be pissed and they're going to have a very good reason to be pissed. Um, that's a lesson that we learned the hard way, um, even though it was a bit indirectly. So to essentially teach, we raised the first sort of, now it'd be called the pre-seed round of 300,000 um, pounds within the first six months of us starting. And at one point, we pivoted with about 50K left in the bank, um, which was a pretty risky move given that we were burning 30K a month. So we had less than a month and a half left of cash. Um, and we weren't sure that we were gonna be able to raise more money. And the money that we were making wasn't covering our burn. So we were trapped in a situation where we had two options. Either we didn't tell our employees that that was the situation that we were in, or we went to them with you know, this pretty bad situation of we might be closing down in essentially five weeks, um, and we ran the risk of them leaving. And what we did at that point is that we thought, as dumb 20-year-olds, that opacity and keeping them motivated was the best way for us to have a chance of raising. And what ended up happening is that we were very lucky in that we managed to sign a term sheet when we only had one week of cash left. And so we were able to, um, to keep everyone on board. But when they learned about it, they really felt like it was a huge form of betrayal. Um, and that was really bad because it meant that that contract of trust that we had with the employees was sort of broken for the, the foreseeable future. And after a while, that meant that they were much more open to other opportunities and eventually some of them left. 
And it was doubly stupid in the sense that um, we, everyone knows when things aren't going that well. So at our biggest teach was only 10 people, so it's big-ish, but not that big. Um, and you know, when there's only 10 people, everyone knows each other very well. And when founders are hiding what the sort of current cash situation is or whatever's going on, um, employees know and everyone speaks with each other. And you get this very bad vibe because you, you know, the employees don't feel necessarily valued and you go up to them and they're not putting their best creative efforts at work to help the company, company survive. To give you an example, recently we had a, comp a company in our portfolio um, that, was, that had just signed a term sheet and then one of the investors pulled out at the last minute and all of a sudden, this is an 80 person uh, company, uh, employee company, um, all of a sudden they were at risk of not being able to pay like 30 of those employees in the next two months. Um, and so they had to find a way to drastically reduce their burn so that they could survive until the actual deal was signed. And the founder faced the exact same decision that I'd faced uh, two years ago. And <laughs> with that experience in mind, um, and transparency now being a very big value, um, we told him, well, you should of course tell them as soon as possible and be transparent about the situation. And so he told all his employees, and the employees of course knew that they were in that situation, but they felt so empowered by the fact that their founder, uh, that the founder had told them all, all about this, that all of a sudden everyone became very creative and they found a way to reduce their burn. That gave them six months of cash and then they were able to raise in much more favorable terms a couple months later. And so the transparency with employees is valuable not only in the sort of long-term relationship that you're trying to build with them, but also just in the short term trying to optimize your outcomes. So now that you have an idea for all the wrong reasons that people don't want to shut down, I think there's very little literature on when is a good moment. And I think one of the reasons is that when's a good moment to shut down at the end of the day is a bit like when's a good moment to break up. It's very hard to theorize. Um, but at the same time, when you know that you want to do it, you sort of do. It's a gut feeling. Um, there's two aspects. One has to do with ideas and profit profitability. So you have to ask yourself, have I tested every single idea that could lead to more growth for my startup? And of course, there's a huge problem in that, in that there's a lot of unknown unknowns. So you don't know about the ideas, or you don't know that you haven't tested some ideas that you don't know exist, right? Obviously, just by definition. Um, but you also do have some feeling about whether or not you've given it your all. So at Teach, um, our big issue, so our thesis was essentially that the tutoring market was saturated uh, because everyone was trying to sell to parents. And so we thought, okay, everyone's trying to sell to parents, so we'll sell directly to students. Um, and what that meant was that instead of competing for AdWords and sort of um, flyering like most tutoring companies do, um, we were doing intense acquisition on Instagram. And because no company does tutoring acquisition on Instagram, everything was very cheap. So we were getting loads of people on board. Um, and we tried different things. We threw parties and stuff, which was like borderline legal given most of our clients were underage. But like it was still like we were trying very much, you know, very different things. Um, and one thing that we hadn't anticipated was that students would be a lot, much, a lot more smarter, a lot smarter, sorry, much more smart, much smarter. Um, that, that was a simple yet complicated grammatical structure. Uh, that students would be much smarter when it came to their tutoring than parents would be. Um, parents, you know, you get a bad grade once on a math test and then your parents decide that they're going to give you three years of math tutoring. Um, students just prepare for that exam and then they prefer to use the iTunes money on new dance moves on Fortnite. Um, and it's very hard when you're a tutoring company selling to kids to compete with Fortnite. Um, and so we were seeing some months where we were losing 15, 20% of our users. And it's very hard to grow um, substantially when you're losing that many users. And so we were testing a lot of crazy things to incentivize students signing up. So we had this horrible situation in which they wouldn't sign up to year-long plans because they didn't want to commit because it was too much money up front. Um, and at the same time, um, once we offered them monthly plans, they just cancel, right? And so we tested loads of different models of paying per minute, blah, 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 and then nothing worked. Um, we'd call them individually. We'd be like, are you sure you want to unsubscribe? You'll lose all the people that you're already being tutored by. And they're like, I don't care. I just wanted the answer to my math exam anyway. And so it was very, very hard. And so at one point we had to shift. And so we started selling to parents. And then when we started selling to parents, a lot of things changed, right? Because that's the second thing. Do you still want to, so once you've tested all those ideas and that you said, okay, I've tested all the ideas and um, you said, okay, can I test, well, sorry, can these ideas bring to my company growing profitably? 
then you need to ask yourself two new questions, which are, do I want to be building that company, right? The company that's the result of all these new, new ideas that I'm testing. And if that's the case, do I want to be building that new company with the co-founders that I'd originally, originally built the company with? Um, and what happened with Teach was that when we shifted to essentially selling to parents, it was a horrible company, right? So like, it was fun selling to teenagers because we could do cool advertisements and like, like everything was a lot funner than what we were doing when we were doing something to parents. When you're selling to parents, you get moms who call you complaining about the fact that their kid got a C um, and it's just a pain, right? You become a concierge and you have to you know, respond to their every need. And like sometimes the, video, the app crashed and they complain a lot. And so you have to do, okay, it's not a problem at all. What's your Skype number? And like it becomes a lot, uh, there's a lot more customer support involved. And that was not at all a company I wanted to build, right? It was a company that had some hope of one day being profitable, but that was not the company I'd initially signed up to build. And that's you know, something that you should be absolutely, um, that, that you should be considering consi constantly, which is um, you, only get, like, you only get to build one company at a time um, and sacrificing a lot of you know, years of your life just because you'd committed to building that initially isn't always gonna be worth it. So for some time you test things out, uh, but that doesn't mean that you have to be super stubborn about it and continue constantly doing that same company. And the other thing was, do I want to be building that company with these people? Um, I was fortunate enough that I'd built the company with two of my very good friends from school. Um, we'd known each other for a very long time, and these were people I trusted a lot and respected a lot. But um, at that point, our sort of interest had started diverging. Um, we hadn't set out to build this company. Um, and we were all you know, thinking like, okay, it's great to work with each other, but our interests are very different now. Um, and I think that we want to be building different things. And my two co-founders are people that I respect a lot, but now one is working in a family office um, doing trading agricultural goods, and the other one is doing lobbying at a think tank. So it just gives you an idea of how different our interests were. Um, and the fact that at that point, we were probably not the founding team that made most sense. And it's healthy to reassess these things as you go along the journey because all these pivots, you know, people try to give loads of different names to essentially admitting that they'd previously made a bad decision. Um, there's pivot, there's hard pivot, there's strategic shift, corporate rebranding, like there's dozens and dozens of names that you can come up with. Um, but people just very much struggle saying, okay, I was wrong. Um, and when you, when you pivot, when you shift, whatever, um, it doesn't necessarily make sense that the people that you were previously associated with are the people that most make sense for the next company. So, when did I realize that Teach was a zombie startup? So I'm, the way I'm going to go through this exercise, because it's always a bit um, humbling slash humiliating to do it, is that I'm going to give you advice on how to figure out what zombie startups look like um, from the outside if you're looking to join a startup. There are also very good rules of thumb um, when you are uh, building your company and you should be checking against these like am I doing things that really matter and then you can draw the analogy in your own mind about what I was doing so the first one is money raised doesn't count so something that a lot of people who want to join very early stage startups so this is for before series B right these are all rounds below 10 million the the amount of money raised below 10 million doesn't really matter and raising money at all isn't um, a huge achievement in and of itself, right? As I mentioned earlier, um, we were three like mildly clever 18 year olds, but not at all superstars. Our idea wasn't the best idea ever. And we didn't have you know, huge amounts of validation from the market. And yet we were able to raise a small seed round. Um, we see a lot, a lot of startups with founders that you know, are, good but not at all amazing, who managed to raise a great amount of money very early on. Um, and that doesn't mean that you should be quitting your job to join these people. Um, obviously, I think it's great that more and more people are investing in startups, but you're taking a big risk leaving your job, joining a company, and so it's important that you get much more validation than just the amount of money that they've raised. And because this is newsworthy and people love hearing about money and big numbers, this is the thing that gets most coverage. So if you open TechCrunch, like half of the articles is X raises uh, Y from Z. And people mostly focus on the Y, which is the amount of money waste. And they don't look much at the Z because it's very hard um, when you're a normal person doing your day job to look at VCs and know who's good and who's not good and look at angel investors and know who's good, who's not good. Um, but the people who are investing are just as important as the amount of money that's being raised. And so instead of just focusing on the amount that's raised, you should mostly be looking at who the people raising from are. 
Um, and if you don't have any idea what the reputation is, then you should reach out to us because that's a big part of our job is making sure that the people investing in our companies are good. And so we have a good idea who's good and who's not good in, in Europe. The next thing is that press and prizes are negative signals. So this is quite counterintuitive because most people are brought up to think that um, if you have your name in the paper, that means you're doing something well. Or, I mean, I guess it's sort of a bell curve. Either you're doing something very well or you're doing something very wrong. Um, and that if you're getting prizes, that means that you're doing something well. But usually in early stage companies, the only thing that really matters is building your product and getting it to users. Um, so if you see founders who are going to loads of pitching competitions and they're getting a lot of press coverage because of these pitching competitions, then you know that they're probably wasting your time. It's very, very rare that these pitching competitions have any value whatsoever. Um, and so if you see that the founder, you know, on, or on the, either on the founder's LinkedIn or on the website's page, you see loads of like startup of the year, blah, blah, blah. You can, as a rule of thumb, know that in 18 months that company's dead. Um, and the same goes for shitty press coverage, right? If you're doing interviews in like weird blogs, like anyone can go, can get a, you know, can get a cover on a blog. Anyone can get an invitation to a podcast, right? Because anyone can start a podcast and anyone can start a blog, right? So by definition, if I'm starting a blog, I'm going to ask my friends. That doesn't mean that my friends are amazing entrepreneurs and that you should be leaving your companies to join theirs, right? Um, and so that's the sort of negative signal you should have in mind, right? It's, it's usually the best companies in the early st stages are mostly under the radar. And so don't, don't get fooled by those things. The next question is, do the employees have skin in the game? Do they have equity? Are they exposed to the potential upside of the company? Um, this is something that is getting in, is much more and more common in European startups. It took a long time, um, but fortunately it's becoming better and better. And it, usually it's not very easy because Founders don't always give you the sort of cap table of the company up front. They don't tell you employee X has you know, this amount of shares and Y has this amount of shares. But you can sort of extrapolate from the offer they give you how generous they are with their equity. Um, and, you know, obviously it matters in the good times because it's great that the wealth generated is shared to some extent with the employees that have participated in that wealth creation. But it's mostly important um, for when shit goes very bad. Because the thing is that if you're only working for your cash salary, and obviously the vision is important, et cetera, as well, but you know, I think looking at financial incentives is a pretty healthy way to, to think of it. So if you're only doing it for the cash, the problem is that when things go badly, the cash is the first thing to leave. Um, and so if that's all that you're getting out of this, then you're going to be looking elsewhere very quickly. Um, and Earlier, I mentioned that it was important for founders to think of themselves as the first shareholder of the company instead of the first employee. I think in the same way, I think it's very healthy for early employees to th think of themselves as some of the first shareholders of the company. Um, for what reason? For the simple reason that as an early employee, you're participating, if the company is doing well, to so much wealth creation um, that that upside should dwarf at some point the amount of cash that you're being compensated for. And the problem is that if you have very little equity or none at all, well, all of those incentives disappear. The, the fourth point on zombie startups is thinking when you're looking at to join one is ask, always asking yourself why they're hiring you in particular and why they're hiring for that position. So it's sort of notorious in startup world that especially er, that in early stage companies, um, the job that you're being hired for won't necessarily be the job that you end up doing naturally you'll gravitate to the place that you most add value to. Um, at the family, for a long time, we'd push that to the extreme where we were hiring people, not even having a job in mind, thinking that if they were good and independent enough, they'd find somewhere to go and find some way to create value. Um, now we're big, bigger, we sort of have to think with, with jobs in mind a bit more. But even then, sometimes we make sort of casting errors and people who we thought were great for one thing end up doing something completely different. Nevertheless, in most companies, um, you hire people for a specific job in mind. And the motivation in that hiring is super important. So the worst reason, um, so sorry, the best reason to hire is that you should be delegating, the founder should be delegating something. So when you're hiring, this is what you should be thinking about as well. You should always hire for um, something that you know how to do very well for two reasons. One, if you know how to do it very well, then you'll be able to know who is able to do it very well because you'll be able to know at this, you'll be able to look at the skills that are required to do that job. Plus, you won't have to micromanage that person because you'll be able to know what sort of the key metrics for that sort of jobs, uh, job is and you'll be able to mentor them and you know, help them do 
um, do better if they're not doing as, as well as you think that they could be doing. Um, we tell our founders to essentially become sick of doing something and do something so intensely that they're sick of doing it before they hire anyone to fill in that position. Um, and so if people are hiring because they, don't, they absolutely don't know, so like recently, to give you sort of a parody of an example, um, some guy came up to me and he was like, so I want to build this um, sort of, this com competitor to Deliveroo in, uh, in Paris and I'm gonna be delivering pizzas. I was like, okay, fine. Uh, you know, you're maybe gonna be creating the best brand of pizzas and quickest delivery, whatever. And he was like, so I'm gonna hire, so I've, I've, I've raised money and I'm gonna hire someone to take care of logistics, someone to take care of building the platform, someone to take care of marketing, someone to take care of the, the relationship with the pizza places, and someone to take care um, of the hiring the drivers. And I was like, but what are you gonna do? And he's like, well, I'm gonna manage them. And I was like, well, well how are you gonna manage? You don't know how to market, you don't know how to hire, you don't know how to build a platform. Like, what, are, what do you mean you're gonna manage them? And he was like, well, yes, it's, isn't that how you do it? You don't know how to do marketing, you hire someone for marketing. And as intuitive as that might sound, the only people who are gonna be willing to come and work for you in those conditions are the worst people. Right? Because if someone's very good at marketing, he's going to want to come with someone who actually knows what he's talking about when he's talking about marketing. Because this guy, as well-intentioned as he was, as soon as he's going to hire all those people and that he's not going to get the results that he wants, he's going to start yelling at everyone and micromanaging them and telling them what to do, um, despite the fact that he doesn't necessarily know. So to give you a more personal example, um, at Teach at some point, right before I realized that the problem was in the model and not in the way we were doing things, so in the fact that we were targeting students and not their parents, um, we did a sort of um, Hail Mary and recruited a s relatively senior person to take care of our marketing. Um, and that person came and you know, he had some ideas, most of which we disagreed with. Um, and in the three months that he was there, we managed to do less campaigns, less tests, less experiments than when it was just us, well, the two, two, two of us co-founders taking care of the marketing. Because we, we're so paranoid about everything that was going on and we left him so little room and we knew so little about what we were supposed to be doing that we would challenge his every move and we'd end up doing so much internal debate and micromanagement because we didn't know what the fuck we were talking about. Um, and that's a big, big issue with early stage companies trying to delegate things that they don't understand. Um, there's a couple cases in which it does make sense to hire for places, things that you don't understand and the two main ones tend to be when you need some form of legal expertise that you don't have or when you need some form of financial expertise that you don't have. And the great thing about those two, or that sort of thing, accounting, whatever, and the great thing about those types of professions is that they tend to be quite regulated and diplomas tend to be a fair-ish reflection of the ability of people. And that's pretty much the only things in which they are a fair-ish reflection of the ability of people. So even if you don't necessarily understand, you can actually trust other people's word for it. Last thing is that transparency is non-negotiable. Last thing, and then we can, do, we can do questions, is that transparency is non-negotiable. So I mentioned earlier, that um, you reach moments where you're struggling um, and you don't necessarily tell your employees and that's bad because when they hear about it, then they can start you know, trusting you less and that creates a bad precedent. Um, but the other reason why it's transparency is non-negotiable as somebody looking to join a company is that if you think about it as an employee, you're like an investor, except you only get to invest in one company at a time, right? So you need to be just as diligent as any investor would be when you're looking at which startup you want to join. Because, you know, um, if, if you assume that you're going to be spending two years at a company on average um, to know what's going on, contribute well, and then invest some of the shares that they're granting you, um, in the next 20 years of your career, that only gives you 10 companies to try out. And the problem is that if the founders are quite opaque with their metrics, opaque with the performance, opaque with what's going on, well, you lose a precious amount of time. Some of our employees could have known much earlier that things weren't going as well as we thought and as, as well as we wished. Um, and yet, because we were opaque on some metrics, struggled to leave, right? And that's a huge opportunity cost for anyone who's trying to find the one rocket, you know, that's gonna make all the other crop companies that they ended up working with worthwhile. Um, and it's the same as a, as a founder, right? Um, you need to accept that you are not your company, right? It's called, limited liability corporation for some reason, right? Is that at the end of the day, you're not responsible for everything going on. You have some responsibility to all the stakeholders, whether those be your clients, whether those be your employees, whether those be your investors, but you are not your company, right? You can let the company die. And it's super scary 
to make that jump, right? Um, even when things weren't going that well, and then when we moved on to a more concierge service, my co-founders wanted to go ahead because they felt that they owed it to other people. But, you know, it's, and, and we'd been doing it for so long, like two and a half years, we'd been doing it for so long that um, it felt very weird to be killing that because it felt like we were killing a part of ourself. Um, but we're, all, we're now all so happy that we made that decision, right? Like, um, I, I can't imagine what my life would have been like if I'd stayed, even if the company had succeeded and I'd spent 10 years there. And I looked back and I was like, wow, I built a very successful UK tutoring company. Like, fuck, what a boring life, right? Um, and sometimes you need to reassess, right? I committed very early on. And I'm not just saying it because I'm bitter because I failed. You know, it sucks that I failed in many respects. And I'm not here to say failing is great. I'm just saying that once you accept that the company isn't doing what you were initially thinking that it was going to do, it's OK to stop and move on to the next thing. Um, and you know, everyone survives. The employees survive. The investors survive and everything. So in summary, before we open to, for questions, um, what, when you're either building a company or, or um, looking to join one, what should you be asking yourself? So not how much money have they raised, but from who and on what terms is the first question you should be asking. Um, then you should be asking, why are they hiring for this position? You should be completely ignoring all the press releases uh, and the prizes that they've, uh, that they've received. And instead, you should be asking everyone what they think of the founders and the current employees. So it's very important to speak to other employees when you're when you're looking to join a company. And then finally, you should, it's very easy to test if there's a culture of transparency within the company or not, right? So you can uh, ask questions, ask to meet people, and if the founders are reluctant to introduce you to other co-founders or other employees, or if they're reluctant to share and disclose information about what's going on in the company, you can very easily see that that's not gonna go. And it's super important, right? Um, like, uh, everyone's gonna tell you that it's important to be loyal, blah, 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 and it is, but it's also important to respect the fact that you only get one chance um, at working at one company at one single time. And so if you have to move on, you have to move on. So now I look on forward to questions, if you have any. Um, yeah. Are there any questions? Yeah, there's a... All right, you, you can't be good at everything. So you say... Um, you need to understand what you're going to be delegating and hiring for. Now, yeah. if you don't know about marketing, how do you solve the issue? Because you still have to solve the issue if you don't yeah, know you about learn. marketing. Yeah, you learn. You learn. All right. Okay. So if, if it takes you six months to learn, it takes you six months to learn. Um, like, it's, it's very rare. It's very rare that it's like, it's such a close call. People tend to think that if there are other people in the market doing the same thing, that it's very important for them to do it very quick. But it's very rare that startups die because of competition. Companies die much early, like, companies die way before competition starts being an issue, right? Markets are very, very big. They're only becoming bigger. Um, and there are a lot of things that kill you before. Bad investors, bad co-founder relationships, um, delegating things you don't understand, uh, hiring the wrong people. All these things kill you way before. And so, if it takes you, you know, three, four months more um, to be growing at the speed that you should be growing at because you need to learn these things, then it's still definitely worth it. Um, still definitely worth it. Back to the zombie uh, question. So when you understood that your company was a zombie startup, yeah. did you understand it by yourself or did the other co-founders understand it or who convinced who that it's time to shut down? So I get to claim that. Uh, that's just, I don't know if it's something I'm super proud of, but I essentially I was looking at the numbers one day and I realized, well, we can continue burning loads of money for a long time, um, but there's something just not fundamentally flawed about the way that we're working. Um, and the problem is that when you're sort of in the heat of the moment, you can find loads and loads of justifications for why things aren't working. So, you know, you can say that you're spending aggressively on marketing um, and that you don't actually know what your cohorts are looking like and that maybe the cohorts are actually profitable. Um, and so you can easily tell yourself stories about the fact that things aren't as bad as they are. Um, but then once we'd had enough hindsight, I think it was about 18 months post-launch, we had a good idea of what the lifetime value of a user would be. Because the problem with our business is that it was very seasonal. So, you know, we had sort of two moments where it was Christmas for us, was literal Christmas. Um, because you have some exams at the end of the year and then it was towards June. So it's very hard for us to actually know whether the things that we were doing were working because you had, if you start a campaign in say April, 
well, you had a huge bump just from the fact that people were preparing for exams, so they, there was a lot of demand for what we were doing. Um, and so once we'd done that twice, we had a better understanding of what was working and what wasn't. Um, and so I just sat down and was like, you know what, I'm not going to go on another round of fundraising for something which I know structurally doesn't work. Um, and it was, it was much harder for some of my co-founders. Um, and I decided, so I, I, I realized that in January 17, decided I want to stop by, um, well, I said I want to stop by June. And then they continued for a couple months after that. And then they'd made their piece with the idea of shutting down. Uh, and we're, we shut down a couple months later. So you never convinced them? To shut down right away? Yeah. No, so I didn't convince them to shut down right away. So I told them, listen, I'll, sh I'll sell you my shares nominal price um, so that you can get ownership of the thing. And then if you want to continue, be my guest. But I just think that this is leading nowhere. Um, and that you know, the sort of conciergerie business isn't one that I want to be building. And they're like, no, we want to give it you know, a, bit, a, more, a couple more months. And I was like, fine. And we explained the situation very clearly to investors. Um, and they were fine with continuing for a bit. And then everyone agreed. And I was a you know, three-month visionary. <laughs> and there was no tensions afterwards? With, with my co-founders? None at all. I mean, you know, like, um, it's not like they forced me to continue. I'd stopped. So they decided to continue. Um, and at the end of the day, they, only, like, they were sort of like, it's not like I betrayed them in the sense that I gave them six months notice as you know, this is what we're going to try to do. And if it doesn't work, I'm pretty sure that this isn't working. You know, it's important to be, honestly, like all the analogies with couples work perfectly with co-founders, um, both co-founders and the company. Um, like, it's not like I left one day and I told them like, I've been cheating with you for, I've been cheating on you for a year. It's like I've been telling them, you know, these are the things that we should be aiming to do. And if we don't do them, I think there's a lot of evidence that we're going nowhere. Um, and it took them a lot of time to, or some time to accept that those metrics were the ones that were relevant. Uh, but then eventually they did. Um, it cost the investors a bit of money, but yeah, that's part of the game. Good luck on the